Previously, we learned how to use t-test to compare two groups. And we will learn how to compare more than two groups using ANOVA or analysis of variance, or sometimes called an f-test. Before we talk about this f-test, uh, we will have a bit of a um, you know, more discussion about the uh, caveats of playing the game of null hypothesis significance testing. By now, I hope you get the hang of playing the game of null hypothesis and testing with t-test. Um, but because of the way we play this game, there are some things to consider when we make a statistical decision with NHST. In general, the goal of NHST is to decide the location of true parameter that is not known to us based on the sample location. So even though we do not know about the true reality, in fact, we may never be able to, and yet uh, the rules of NHST seem to um, force us to make a such sharp binary decision by either rejecting or fail to rejecting the null based on a fuzzy threshold of alpha 0.05. Now let's just hold on to it for a moment, accepting that uh, that is just the rule of the game. But because of the very rule, NHST bears some interesting implications after each decision we make. Now let's turn to the table here. The status of the true reality about the null that is unknown to us is listed column-wise, right? So H. Um, the null true and null false. So that is the true reality uh, you know, that is not known to us. And the rows uh, representing uh, the decision we make about the true reality after running the null hypothesis significance testing. So again, we either reject or fail to reject the null. So under this scheme, we are making correct decisions in two cases um, that are when we reject the null and the null, we reject the null and the null is indeed false in reality. And in another case, we make a correct decision when we fail to reject the null and the null is indeed false in reality. However, if we reject null when the null is true in reality, then we just made an error called type 1 error. So this is uh, when you claim that there is something when in fact nothing. So this is basically a false alarm. The alarm goes off even though there is no fire. On the other hand, if you fail to reject the null after running an NHST, but when in fact the null is false, then you just made an error called type 2 error. And this is when you claim that there is nothing when in fact there is something. This time, the alarm doesn't go off when there is fire. So between these two types of error, and statistical hypothesis testing research is heavily weighted against the type 1 error, meaning that researchers are more concerned about saying they found something important or significant interesting when in fact they didn't. So they're more concerned about um, you know, lying about their result or the findings or discovery. So that concern is echoed in the nominal alpha 0.05, which is an explicit decision rule to reject the null only when the likelihood of observing the data or statistics as extreme as or more extreme is less than or equal to 1 out of 20 or 5 out of 100 times instead of being 50-50. So to um, better illustrate this point, um, let's take a rather extreme example. Imagine a um, hypothetical courtroom where 
death penalty is possible if the defendant is convicted. So here we have two mutually opposing and exclusive verdicts, innocent, uh, which is our null, or guilty, which is our alternative. So understandably, they cannot be considered equally weighted as the consequence of the guilty verdict is permanent and irreversible once the sentence is carried out. Therefore, the judge um, cannot be impartial in evaluating the evidence from the prosecution, and the judge will be much more careful not to return a guilty verdict as much as possible unless the presented evidence supports way beyond a just reasonable doubt, making the case extremely strong. So, assuming that we do not know what truly happened, there is always a chance that we may make a mistake in our decision, as we can see from the table here. So, in this hypothetical example, um, the decision, uh, the, the consequence, sorry, the consequence of returning the guilty verdict, so, uh, you know, in other words, rejecting the null by mistake, which is the false positive F+. Plus. It can be that serious for both defendant as well as the prosecution. So as such, you want to minimize the occurrence of false positives in making a decision in this context. In other words, you became more conservative in rejecting the null by setting the level of significance alpha as low as possible. So in a nutshell, it is, this example is kind of similar to how statistical hypothesis testing is used in a research context and why the decision rule um, to reject the null is set so conservative. However, there are other um, situations where minimizing the false negatives become more desirable uh, such as in medical screening. Now, let's think about another hypothetical example where you want to find out whether you or your partner is pregnant or not. So here, the pregnant is the alternative and not pregnant is your no. So um, you want to you know, test um, the pregnancy using one of these uh, pregnancy screening kits. Um, as shown here. So the test works by detecting the hormone called the human chorionic gonadotropin, which is um, uh, you know, HCG in short, in urine sample or blood secreted by the placenta after the fertilized egg implants in a female's uterus. So it is claimed that the sensitivity of the test is 95%, where the sensitivity is defined as the performance of a test to correctly identify a condition uh, when in fact the person is pregnant. So that is true positive, like a T plus here. So that is the true positive. In this case, right? Um, but the sensitivity of the test is only one of the components to characterize the accuracy of the test. And there's another component um, of accuracy of a test is called specificity, which is defined as the ability to exclude people who do not have the condition. Again, uh, the two, two hypotheses cannot be uh, equally, so cannot, they, they cannot have equal bearings depending upon uh, whom you ask. For example, let's say if you're an unemployed, unmarried teenager, right, then missing pregnancy, which is false negative, okay, so that's false negative here, right, um, by mistake, uh, bears much more serious consequence later compared to detecting pregnancy, pregnancy by mistake, uh, which is false positive, right, this one. Um, so, um, in general, medical screening and diagnostic te uh, uh, tests are weighted highly toward sensitivity, not to miss the condition. So, the dilemma here is that sensitivity and specificity have a reciprocal relationship, 
So if one increases, then the other typically goes down. So from these two examples, uh, we can understand that statistical hypothesis testing can be flexible enough to test any hypothesis as long as we are aware of the other consequences after whatever decision we make. But at the same time, you need to remember that you do not prove anything with null hypothesis significance testing. Nothing is proven. I say this again. Nothing is proven with NHST. You know, it is not like a mathematical theorem you try to prove, okay? You always have to remember that whatever decision you make with NHST is just a probabilistic statement. And no such statement can be 100% or 0% true or false under the null hypothesis significance testing. So for example, you still have this probability of making the type 1 error at the level of significance you preset to make the decision in case the null is true in reality. And from that sense, rejecting the null, uh, rejecting the null does not mean that you accept the alternative as true. I would just say the evidence strongly supports the um, H1 instead of saying I accept the H1 or I proved my point. Please, and I say it again, please do not say that you proved anything with NHST because I have an allergic reaction to the expression and I might die from anaphylactic shock, okay? So, by the same token, failing to reject the null does not mean that we have shown that there is no effect. First of all, we assigned very generous margin of doubt to the null, so that is really not fair to say that there is no effect when we fail to reject the null. And secondly, absence of evidence is not the same as the evidence of absence. So, well, so, and, you know, by the same token, here we have the probability. So, um, so here the big P represents probability uh, that you will observe a certain data set, right? Data, this vertical line is read given. So the probability that you will see a certain data set given the theory is true is not the same as the probability that the theory is true given a certain data set. Okay, so they are not the same thing. So you cannot just you know, flip back and forth to mean the same thing. They are not necessarily the same, right? So you always have to remember that the absence of evidence is not the same as the evidence of absence. And finally, a um, statistically significant result is not necessarily practically significant. However, if a result is not statistically significant, then it's very likely that the result is not practically significant either. Um, but, you know, in any circumstances, you should not equate a statistically significant result with an important result because p-value itself does not tell us about how important an effect actually is, nor if the hypothesis of interest is true or false. Statistically speaking, a very small and unimportant effect can be statistically significant with a large, large number of samples. By the same token, a very large and important effect can be missed simply because the sample size is too small. Now that we have talked about all these caveats and errors associated with NHST, now let's come back and talk about comparing multiple groups. Like I said in the beginning, t-test is used to compare two groups and ANOVA or analysis of variance will be used to compare more than two groups. 
Now, one of the questions you may have is that, you know, why we need other statistics to compare multiple groups when we think we can use t-test to do the same thing. So let's say that um, you want to compare three groups to see if there's any difference between any two groups. Then the question is, can we just do the pairwise comparisons one at a time to figure out which groups are different from each other? In theory, you can, but with caveats related to the ones that we have just talked about previously. So to illustrate what the caveat is, let's take a look at this comic. A girl with a black ponytail, right, uh, comes to Cubo. So we, we call this guy Cubo, or guy, or, you know, um, um, a girl, with a claim that jelly beans cause acne. And Cubo then commissioned two scientists, a man with goggle and the other girl, right, to do some research on the possible link between jelly beans and acne. They find no link, and now the ponytail insists that it was the specific color that causes acne. So the scientists run 20 additional NHSTs, and they find one significant result out of 20 different colors, and report to the news that um, the green jelly bean is linked to acne. In this story, the scientists use the nominal level of significance alpha 0.5 as their decision rule. Therefore, when the scientists find low, no link between jelly beans and acne, then that should have settled the case in the first place. However, the ponytail and cue ball ask them to test 20 different colors, each at a significance level of 5% to see if it is for a specific color, which breaks the decision rule as the alpha point of five is defined as the probability that a result or more extreme result will occur by chance um, as one out of 20. So even by sheer chance, you expect to observe at least one significant result when you keep running 20 experiments given the hypothesis. In fact, there are a number of problems with the approach, but more theoretical problem behind the multiple hypothesis testing is the inflation of type 1 error rate. When the probability that each trial gives a false positive result is set at 1 out of 20, then by testing 20 different colors, it becomes much more likely that at least one jelly bean test will give a false positive. To be precise, the probability of having no false positive in 20 tests is 0.95. So when alpha level is 0.05, uh, is uh, given by the equation in the, uh, the second bullet, so it becomes 0.95 to the 20, right? So power of a 20, and it will become 35%, uh, 35.85%. So in other words, the probability of having at least one significant result just by pure chance will be about 64%. So when we set alpha at 0.05 for a t-test, for example, that is only meant to be used for a single comparison between the two groups. So if we have more groups to compare, then the number of pairwise comparisons will also increase. When the number of comparisons to make increases, then the family-wise error rate also increases. For example, let's say that we have three groups to compare to see if there's any uh, difference between any two groups. Then the number of pairwise comparisons uh, can we, we can possibly make between these three groups uh, becomes, um, you know, three. So let's say that we have groups A, B, and C. Then we can make uh, uh, pairwise comparisons between A and B, A and C, and B and C. So, 
When we have three groups to compare, then the number of possible pairwise comparisons increases from one to three. How about four groups? Then the number of possible pairwise comparisons increases to six, which is determined by this uh, following equation. Right? Um, so here C represents the number of pairwise comparisons. K uh, represents, the K represents um, the number of groups. Uh, and this exclamation mark um, represents uh, a factorial. So this is a, a factorial sign, which is the product of all positive integers less than or equal to a certain positive integer or the k positive integer. Um, so for example, three factorial means three times, two times, one. So it'll become six. So the graph shown here represents the relationship between the number of means to compare on the x-axis and the number of pairwise comparisons on the y. So as we can see, the number of pairwise comparisons um, exponentially increases as the number of means to compare increases following this equation. And when the number of means increases, right, and then the family-wise error rate also increases. So people come up with some corrections to control this inflation of type 1 error. One of them is called Bonferroni correction, where you divide the nominal alpha 0.05 by the number of comparisons you're going to make. For example, if you have four groups to compare, then the new alpha after the correction will be 0.05 divided by 6, which will become less than 0.01. Therefore, you need much more stronger evidence um, to reject the null. As such, this correction is not so ideal as it quickly becomes too conservative to find any significant result when you have many groups to compare. Then how do we test multiple groups without risking the inflation of type 1 error? This is where ANOVA comes in. Um, so ANOVA, or Analysis of Variance, became widely known after being included in Fisher's 1925 book, Statistical Methods for Research Workers. In a nutshell, ANOVA is used to test the general differences between two or more means rather than specific differences among means by analyzing variance instead of means. Under ANOVA, the null is that all group means are the same, or more theor uh, theoretically speaking, all groups are random samples from the same population. On the other hand, the null can be rejected if at least one of the group means is statistically different from other group means. With ANOVA, type 1 error is controlled at alpha 0.05 regardless of the number of means to compare because you only run a single test. Before we get into the details of the test, there are some special lingos associated with ANOVA we need to know. First, a factor refers to an independent grouping or response variable. Sometimes it is called a way too. So, uh, for example, if an experiment has one factor, then you will conduct a one-way ANOVA. If two factors, then two-way ANOVA. Like in t-test, a factor can be between or within. It is also possible that you have mixed factors if there are two or more factors. For example, if a two-way ANOVA has one between factor and one within, then we have mixed factor design and we need to run two-way mixed ANOVA. If you have more than two factors to test, then your ANOVA becomes a multifactorial ANOVA, but this module will only focus on one-way ANOVA. 
under a factor, there are more than two levels. If two levels, then it is a t-test. So to help you understand the terms, here are some example studies. So in this study, 50 participants were each tested on the efficacy of a new drug to reduce LDL, the bad cholesterol. Their blood level LDLs were tested over three time periods, uh, baseline after three months and after six months. So in this case, the experiment is about uh, the efficacy of a drug to see if it'll reduce the, uh, the blood level LDL um, as a function of time. So in this case, a factor is a time, right? So this is a, you know, um, the, the effect of time, right? Um, so the time is a factor in this case, and this is a within factor, right? Because um, this factor is repeated within uh, the subjects, so within all you know, 50 participants, right? So you measure uh, the LDL of the 50 participants at baseline, and their LDL level is measured again after three months of the treatment, and then uh, the same 50 participants tested on their blood level LDLs after they're uh, treated for six months. So this factor is repeated within the subject. So this is a within factor. And what is being measured here to see the effect of the drug? So what is the dependent variable, DV, or outcome variable? It is LDL, right? LDL uh, has been measured repeatedly over three time periods. So the dependent variable is LDL. And how many factors do we have here? We only have a single factor, which is time, right? And then under this time factor, we have three different time periods, right? So that's the level of that factor. So baseline, after three months, and after six months, we have three levels under the time. And the type of ANOVA to perform is called one-way repeated ANOVA or one-way within subject ANOVA. So here is another study. So in a clinical trial of a new drug to reduce blood pressure, two different dosages um, 0 and 20 microgram were given to four age groups. So each individual patient was tested on all dosages regardless of their age group. So in this case, um, what is factor? Or what are the, are the factors? In fact, there are two factors. So one factor is dosage, right? And the other factor is age group. Right. So actually, the, the, the goal of this study is to see the effect of the drug on different dosages and on, on also on the different age groups. Right. Um, so in this case, we have two factors, one between and one within. So the between subject factor is the age group. Right. It is between because um, you know, no one in one age group cannot be in the other group. So these groups are mutually exclusive, right? Um, on the other hand, dosage is actually within subject factor, right? Because uh, as it says in the paragraph, each individual patient was tested on all dosages. So the dosages are repeated within subject, right? So we have one between subject factor and one within subject factor in this experimental design. And what is the outcome variable? What is the dependent variable here to see the effect of the drug? So that is the blood pressure. So that's what's being measured to see um, if the drug is effective um, in reducing the blood pressure. And the number of factors too, uh, we already covered this, and number of levels for each factor. 
So for between factor, which is the age group, we have four levels, four age groups, because we have four different age groups, right? So under uh, the age group factor, we have four levels. On the other hand, we have two levels for dosage factor, right? We have, you know, no drug and 20 microgram as a, as a two levels for the dosage factor and total number of separate groups needed and so because we have a between factor right we pro we, we uh, need uh, four different separate groups right um, because you know these groups are the, the levels of the age group are mutually exclusive so we need to actually recruit four separate groups right um so um the type of ANOVA to perform for this experimental design is two by four or four by two mixed ANOVA here the number represents the number of levels in each factor right so it's a two by four so the first is the number of levels of the dosage right so that's within factor and then the next number and four represents the levels in the age of what the the between factor right um it doesn't really matter which comes first right but you need to um specify the number of levels in each factor and the number of factors right so we have two factors here two and four and they are just um so each number represents the number of levels um under a factor and mixed on over right because we have one between one within subject factor so this is um you know mixed design so we're going to run mixed ANOVA okay so here is the last example for you Please have a moment to read the paragraph and ask yourself the same set of questions like before and see if you can answer those questions. Once you figure it out, then please drop me an email your answer. As I said earlier, F distribution is a sampling distribution of variance. Um, it has two degrees of freedom where DF1 is called the model degrees of freedom and the df2 is called the error degrees of freedom unlike the t or normal distribution the shape of f distribution changes uh, drastically with the different degrees of freedom under this distribution the p value of an f ratio is defined as the area under the curve from the observed p uh, f value to the right tail only so say you know this area under the curve is bounded by certain f value here right so f ratio and the area is just um, um it's just a right tail from that f value right so if the p value is less than alpha 0.5 we still use the alpha 0.5 then we reject the null of no difference and say that at least one group mean is different from other group means otherwise we fail to reject the null 